Medieval Philosophy and the Theory of Emanationism. Here we go. This is a fun theory. Last time uh, I introduced medieval philosophy and I told you that um, throughout the Middle Ages, thinkers kept returning to the debate between Plato and Aristotle um, for various reasons that I, I don't have time to go into. Throughout that long period of 400 to 1400, there's times where uh, times and places throughout medieval Europe where Plato wins the day with most people, and there's times when Aristotle wins the day with most people. But throughout the Middle Ages, people always had various levels of awareness of Plato and Aristotle, and various levels of awareness of the tension between them. Because there was such respect among so many intellectuals for the Greek heritage that was uh, uh, brought to its, its grand fulfillment in the philosophical systems, systems, I say, these are big systems, those of Plato and Aristotle, because people had so much respect for them, um, very few people were ever willing to just say, Plato was wrong, or I'm on team Aristotle, you know, or I'm on team Plato, Aristotle was wrong. Usually, usually what people um, tended to want for most of the med medieval period, most um, intellectuals would look for ways to synthesize Plato and Aristotle. Hey, I I'm, I'm having deja vu. I did that in the last lecture. I, t I, I said synthesize, and I went like that in the last lecture, I think. Last time I was talking about the Middle Ages as a synthesis, this is the universal sign for synthesis, I guess, the synthesis between faith and reason, well, there was also a desire to synthesize the thought of Plato and Aristotle. Plato, recall, thought that reality, as studied by philosophers, reality, it's its central point is in the world of forms. That's where philosophers should turn their attention, according to Plato. Aristotle, recall, saw a huge problem with the theory of forms and said, no, where we should be turning our attention to, the central, the, the focus point of reality is the substances that populate our universe. Well, many medieval thinkers saw the value of both Plato and Aristotle. And um, the Neoplatonists um, especially tried to champion a synthesis of Plato and Aristotle through the theory of emanationism, which I'll be describing in a moment. I want to devote this little lecture to emanationism, um, one, because I think it's a neat theory. I think whether, whether you buy it or not, um, you've got to admit it's a really neat theory. Second, if you ever decide to do more studying of medieval philosophy, it's a wonderful thing for you to do. Uh, it helps to remember this kind of emanationist thinking is in the background of many philosophers' um, um, thoughts on many subjects. Different philosophers uh, were influenced by emanationism to various uh, degrees. Some bought into it full-on, just the way I'm about to describe it, for some, they saw, they saw it as, as, you know, getting close to the right picture, but not quite right. Uh, but for many, many medieval philosophers and theologians, uh, uh, this way of thinking is lurking in the background of other things they have to say. So I want to describe the theory of emanationism. Uh, if, if you need a name, you say, Kovacs, you going to give us a name? Is there any philosopher we could really associate with? emanationism? Um, well, the Neoplatonic school that flourished like 400 to 800 AD, uh, the whole Neoplatonic school did. Um, sometimes emanationism is really associated with a guy called Plotinus. And you say, who was this Plotinus guy? Was he a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim? None. He was, in fact, a pagan. He was not what we would consider a, a monotheistic um, religious person. Uh, nevertheless, um, he did a lot to contribute to um, the Neoplatonic theory of emanationism. 
So I'm going to describe emanationism in broad outline, not as it was promulgated by Plotinus or any other particular person, but just the, the kind of general theory that's lurking in the background of many medieval thinkers. So let's talk about Plato's forms for a second. Let's talk about just one particular form for a second, the coolest form of them all, the form of the good. Goodness itself. Right? Not, a good, not this good thing or that good thing, right? But what is it in virtue of which I can call this thing good and that thing good? The good itself. The best form of forms. In fact, picking up on something Plato said, the medieval thinkers often considered the good to just be the form of form. Right? What is it in virtue of which... That's a form and that's a form. The form of forms itself. Formness itself, which is the form of the good. And the form of the good is awesome! It's totally awesome. It doesn't get any better. The form of the good, it kind of it kind of looks at itself and it realizes, like, this is just goodness with no admixture of anything other than goodness. This is just goodness through and through. It's not a good dog or a good cat. It's just good, good, being good. That's awesome. And it's so awesome. It's so good. So good that it can't contain itself. If it could contain itself, it would be limited. It would be somehow finite. And then it wouldn't be as good. If, it, if, it had a, if there was a limit to goodness, that would be bad. A limit to goodness is bad. Think about that. A limit to goodness is bad. So, the form of the good must just not have a limit. It just has to kind of spill out. Well, how does it spill out? And I'm going to, I'll change the camera angle so I can talk about this here. Here we go. <laughs> That's right. Using the special effects today. So we've got the form of the good. Up there. And it's going, it, it just can't contain itself. So it just starts spilling out into other good things. And because it's, it's so good, it's so brimming over with greatness, it wants to imitate itself. Every possible way the good can be imitated, it will be. So, how can we imitate the good? Well, one way, the most basic way of imitating the good is to do something the good does. Well, the good is real. The good exists. So, how, what if there was something that imitated the form of the good, the goodnesses, goodnesses existence? Something that just exists, like, you know, rocks, dirt, little pebbles, the elements on the periodic table. There. Now good has spilled over into things that are kind of like the good itself. Rocks, water, minerals. Like the good itself, they exist. Awesome! But wait, there's more ways of imitating goodness. One way that, that some medieval thinkers thought about this is, is goodness looks at itself. It sees, hey, we're being imitated by existing things. How else can, can, can this goodness, that, that, how, how, how else can we be imitated? It uses the royal we, the form of the good. How else can we be imitated out there? Well, what if there were things that also, in addition to just existing, also existed as perceiving, or, or, or as growing, as living, as living? So like plants and trees. Plants and trees have abilities that make them more like the form of the good than rocks are. For one thing, they reproduce. They reproduce. Hey, the form of the good has produced more good things, more things that are somehow like it. So plants and trees and vegetables and flowers, they're even more 
like the form of the good than rocks are, because in addition to existing, they also have an activity. Life, acti life is an activity, and plants, trees, flowers have it. So, the good is emanating out. The good is making more good because it can't help itself. It has to produce this stuff. And then the good looks and says, there's other ways goodness can be imitated. There's more ways of imitating the good than just plants, trees, and stuff that exists. What if something had the ability, had an activity, more than just reproduction? What if something had an activity of perception and motion and change, right? Biological animal life. Mr. Whiskers. Mr. Whiskers imitates the form of the good by being an animal. And then, what else could imitate the good? Well, of course, what if there was something which imitated the good by existing, by having life activities, by having sense perception and local motion, but also the ability to understand the good, the ability to think about all the good things. The ability to perceive the universe and recognize it as good. That's going to be even better. Lastly, what if there was an understanding, what if there were intellectual minds that weren't contained to a particular place and time like we are? What if there were immaterial, they called them the intelligences. These were minds capable of seeing the good in the universe, capable of thinking scientifically about the universe, um, recognizing, understanding the universe. When I say thinking scientifically about the universe, I don't mean doing experiments. I mean understanding just how the universe works. Um, these are the, the disembodied intelligences. Related to, oh, hello, <laughs> related to the theory of emanationism is the theory called the great chain of being. The great chain of being. You'll, you'll hear that talked about a lot in um, philosophy. What's the idea? The idea here is right now we have a chain of being where every level of the chain, every link is filled in. Every way of existing as good has been filled. First, by just existing at all. Then, by existing as capable of reproducing. Then, capable of reproducing and also perceiving. Being able to somehow interact in a, a meaningful way with the world. Animal life. Then, is there a higher level of existence? Is there another chain on the link? Sure. An animal that doesn't merely perceive the world around it but also cognizes the world around it, organizes intellectually, scientifically, an understanding of reality. That's us. Is there a higher level on the chain of being? Sure. At least conceivably there is. There could be. There could be intellects cognizing the universe that aren't animals. By the way, um, um, Jewish, Christian, and I believe Islamic um, inheritors of emanationism, um, they have a special word for the intelligences. Do you know what it is? They call them angels. Angels. Those are the disembodied intelligences. Uh, of course, Plato and Aristotle and the Neoplatonists did not believe in angels per se, but they recognized the possibility of disembodied minds, disembodied intellects. So, uh, and, and some of you may have already recognized, of course, um, um, some of these um, Christian, Jewish, Muslim thinkers realize that the good itself, what's that? It's what we worship. It's God. The good itself. That's not surprising. God is goodness itself. God, recognizing how awesome God is, realizing how um, devastating it would be, if God were not imitated, if the goodness of God were not imitated, God just like spills out, 
just spills out and emanates and fills in all the ways God's beauty and perfection might be imitated, might be reflected, might be copied. Well, what does this mean? This means everything is good as a imitation of the divine goodness. It means you, you, on your worst day. If you're still alive on your worst day, you're still an imitation. You're existing, you're alive. Why are you alive on your worst day? You're alive on your worst day. The reason you're still alive is because the good itself needs you to be alive. I'm going to use the word need in a loose sense here. Um, different philosophers had different ideas about the necessity of this. Um, but, but for some reason, the good itself has realized that if it's going to fill in all the links on the chain, if every link on the chain of being is going to be filled in, you're going to have to be there. You're an important part of the link. Everything is. This is why everything is good. This is why there's the medieval theory called the theory of the transcendentals. We don't have to worry about what that means right now. This theory is that goodness and existence are the same thing. To exist is good. To be good is to exist. Of course, there's bad things that exist, but what makes them bad is not what they are, but the ways they aren't. We could talk more about that some other time. For now, I just want you to think about this theory of emanationism, this notion of the great chain of being, this notion that Every way of being, every way of existing has to be filled in on the chain. All the ways goodness can be imitated have to be filled in, in the chain of being. This was a very big idea in the Middle Ages. Uh, some philosophers would um, go so far as to say that this is the best argument, the best philosophical argument, for the existence of angels. Right? Um, Obviously, there can't be a, a scientific demonstration of an angel if an angel is something not physical. There's no experiment we could set up to see if there's an angel. But medieval thinkers pointed out that it would certainly be convenient. They called it a per conveniens argument, right? It would be appropriate for there to be angels. There would be something perverse about creation if that level, that link in the chain of being were left blank. If God had created all the ways of imitating God's goodness, except one. But this is what I, I referred to previously as a probabilistic argument, right? Uh, it's an inductive kind of argument. Yeah, it, it does seem fitting that there would be the intelligences, the angels, but it's merely a, a probabilistic kind of argument. Indeed, emanationism itself is a kind of probabilistic argument, usually. It's usually presented that way. If you're interested in this sort of thing, um, classes here at Loyola Marymount University. Um, I know Professor Pearl teaches the Intro to Augustine class where this gets covered, uh, as well as the, the Ancient Philosophy class. Also, a lot of this gets covered, and, and um, some of it gets covered in the Medieval Philosophy classes as well. I'm presenting it as part of Medieval Philosophy but Plotinus is sometimes also tagged on at the end of ancient philosophy because he wasn't a Christian Jew or a Muslim. Okay, fun theory, emanationism. Go, go talk to your friends about it. Tell your parents about it. See if, you can, see if you can talk about emanationism in a way that it's not just crazy, right? That it's not just um, speculative, right? Uh, um, it's not pure speculation, like, hey, maybe there's aliens out there. No, it's, it's actually thinking about what would have to be the case if you were to think about something like the form of the good. Or you can come at it the other way. You might think about it, well, let's just think about the world of substances. You can get to emanationism, okay, thinking about it platonically, thinking about the form of the good and what would happen if there were such a form. Or you can think about it Aristotelianly. Think about the substances. Well, what kind of substances are there? Well, there's the lowest level. There's rocks and dirt and stuff like that. But there's also a kind of higher level. There's, there's substances that have life activity. 
There's something higher still. There's life activity substances that also have a kind of higher life activity, a kind of uh, operation that lets them move through space and engage meaningfully with their surroundings. That's animals. There's still a higher form of substance in our universe, us. We engage meaningfully with the world around us in a very peculiar way, this linguistic, scientific way of engaging and trying to understand and organize the universe in our minds. And hey, if you see how the universe is organized that way, it's not that hard to think there must be one more level up there, something doing what we do, but not limited to a particular time and place the way we are, something immaterial. And then you might say, well, what's it all coming from? And then you get the form of the good, some, uh, something that's just existence itself, something divine. Talk to your friends and family about it. See if you can't talk about it in a way that actually makes it sound actually pretty reasonable. If you can do that, you're making great progress in your study of medieval philosophy. If you can't, well, stay tuned for the next lecture. Maybe you'll find Thomas Aquinas brings things back down to earth.